everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com and it's time to look at Monday Night Raw. This week's Raw was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and it was the go-home show for this Sunday's SummerSlam pay-per-view. But how good was Raw? There's only one way to find out and that is by giving each individual segment a lovely individual grade. That's right, this is Monday Night Raw grade. <laughs> So we started things off with all of the roster on the stage and a nice tribute to those who sadly lost their lives in both Ohio and Texas. Uh, and also later on in the show as well, there was a tribute to Harley Race, who also sadly lost his life last week. So I'm not going to grade those segments. You know, they were both very necessary and very well done and very touching moments. And I think that you know, they were handled as well as they could have been given the tragic circumstances. Now on to the show, which started off in unorthodox fashion, really, because just as the titles were ending, we had Samoa Joe perched on the announce table and just giving it large on the microphone. Joe says that he's been wrongfully accused of being the man who pushed the scaffolding on Roman Reigns last week on SmackDown. And he's been accused of this all week. He's absolutely sick of it and he wants an apology. And then Michael Cole, right? So Joe's just been very intimidating, standing on the announce table bellowing into the microphone and Michael Cole goes but Joe there was a poll done on WWE.com where 80% of the WWE universe thought that I was just like oh Michael act a little bit afraid come on now man Cole tells Joe that 80% of the WWE universe think that it was he who pushed the scaffold on Roman Reigns Joe brings up a very good point and says that's no proof and also says I think that 80% of the WWE universe are idiots which is also tr which hmm no comment they show footage from the attack last week and, well, uh, what, I didn't really enjoy the whole thing last week. I enjoyed the storyline and the mystery of it, but I didn't enjoy the execution of it. I thought it was too melodramatic, too many cameras, too many camera cuts, that sort of thing. And they've kind of made it a bit worse by sticking it in a hype video and putting spooky music over the top. It just makes it feel a little bit less real to me. But anyway, the video finishes. Joe is still not satisfied and says, look, I'm going to wait all night for an apology from Roman because he did not deny that I was the man who pushed the scaffolding on him. Uh, I'm going to wait here all night. And if anyone's got a problem with that then they can bang he's immediately cut off by Becky Lynch I was like this is interesting I wonder what sort of interplay there's going to be between the two unfortunately there was no interplay she was just on her way to her match because that was up next yeah fair enough this was a decent opening to Raw it was certainly different uh, it felt very you know like Paul Heyman shaking up the game and everything so I'm going to give it a B grade I thought it was good on paper a good idea on paper reminiscent of when Seth Rollins took over takeover that time uh, but in execution slightly less effective than maybe they wanted it to be I will say the segment was totally saved by Samoa Joe's amazing mic ability because if it was in the hands of a less charismatic superstar I think this could have been a bit of an awkward opening to Raw instead it was pretty good pretty decent and B is the grade and now we get the first match of the night Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair you know uneasy tag partners what's gonna happen against Natalia and Trish Stratus obviously Natalia and Becky are set to do battle at SummerSlam over the Raw Women's Championship and on the other side of things uh, Charlotte and Trish are set to do battle at SummerSlam as well for the crown of the best ever in any era of women's wrestling or something you, you know what I mean I'll talk about w what I felt about the booking of this match a little bit later when I do the grade but for now the match itself was absolutely fine I really enjoyed the opening segments where Becky and Natalia were going at it with like amateur wrestling moves both looking for submissions all the while that was pretty good and it feeds into the stipulation of their SummerSlam match at one stage Becky blind tagged herself in off the back of Charlotte and Charlotte just got annoyed at that shoved Becky down and walked to the back she abandoned the match and that led to Natalia being able to clamp on the sharpshooter but Becky didn't tap out or even pass out. She actually made the ropes, but Natalia refused to heed the referee's five count and he was forced to disqualify her from the match. Uh, Natalia kept the sharpshooter locked in until Trish, her partner, was actually forced to come into the ring, shove Natalia off, and there was a bit of a stare down between those two as well. So yeah, I, I found this a bit of a difficult one to fully invest in because I think there were just too many cross lines in terms of the booking of it and the alignment of everybody. So on one side of things, we've got a full-on heel in Charlotte teaming with... Uh, baby face with tweenerish tendencies on the other side of things we've got a full-on baby face in Trish Stratus teaming with a uh, tweenerish heel or a heelish tweener or whatever Natalia is at the moment I also didn't enjoy that they use Trish Stratus here not because I'm not a fan of Trish Stratus just because I think they should have saved her for SummerSlam as more of like a special attraction kind of deal whereas now we've seen her in a match already and not just that she appeared and just did nothing as well I don't know whether it would have even been better if she'd gone in there and hit a few moves I don't know but to have her come out for 
almost no purpose until the angle at the very end of the match, I think was a bit of a waste. I'd have liked to have seen her maybe kept under wraps, maybe limited to a promo segment or something like that, and then unveiled at SummerSlam, and it would have given the match more of a special feel, I think. With all that said, though, the match itself was totally fine, so I'm going to give it a B- minus grade. Nothing groundbreaking, no fireworks, but it got the job done, I think. Next up, Rey Mysterio versus Andrade. This was obviously brilliant. We know about the chemistry that these two guys have, and I'm never really going to complain at this stage about the pair of them meeting in the middle of the ring. They haven't wrestled nearly enough for me to get sick of it yet. This wasn't just good in terms of moves though, this was also excellent in terms of storytelling with Andrade again going after Rey Mysterio's mask. He tore at the mask, Rey had to readjust it a little bit, the referee dragged Andrade off, and while Rey was recovering, leaning over the ropes, Zelina Vega got on the apron and hit him with, like a stunner kind of, dropping his neck across the middle rope, and that led to Rey rebounding back into the ring and being caught in Andrade's hammerlock DDT, allowing Andrade to pick up the victory. This gets an A-, minus. good match, great pacing, really good execution of moves, good storytelling, loads of convincing near falls, all that good stuff. Uh, it's also been a great week, really, for Lucha Libre with Triple Mania, Triple A's big show of the year, impressing so much over the weekend. Yeah, Viva La Mexico. Oh my God, I'm so English. I'm so very English. And now, oh, let's talk about the 24-7 Championship. Normally, I do a bit of a roundup of all the little segments that have happened on Raw because there's normally a little few scattered all over the place. This week, there was just one, and boy, howdy, was it a bit of an eventful one. So we get a clip of earlier today. It says 2 p.m. at the OBGYN clinic with Maria and Mike Kanellis. They're in the waiting room. Maria is just berating Mike and obviously being a dick to him, as she has for the past few weeks. And eventually, the doctor calls them in. They go in. Maria's got the belt around her waist and keeps on referring to it as like my baby but it's like she's also carrying a baby so it's a bit of you see what they're doing there do you see um she again berates mike while she's lying on the reclining chair and says you better swear that you'll protect me and my title and mike's like of course i will don't worry about it gives her a little hug while she's reclining oh one two three mike canales is the new 24 7 champion i honestly right i was at first a bit like this is going to be crap and then when that happened and the doctor ripped off her coat to reveal that it was the referee i was like that's pretty good. I laughed despite really not wanting to enjoy it. I actually did quite a lot. But it's not over yet because Mike is the champion. He grabs the title, runs out of the room, runs back into the waiting room, and two of the people in the waiting room have changed. Uh, it's now Carmella and our truth in a cunning sort of disguise. They have newspapers above their faces, and obviously, Mike Canellis doesn't realize it's them until very, very late on. Truth gets up, distracts Mike by pretending to give birth. He's wearing maternity clothes. He pretends to give birth, fetches a doll from underneath his garments, throws it at Mike Canellis, who goes to catch it, who goes to catch the doll. And that allows Truth to roll him up. And now Truth is an 11 time 24 seven champion. Listen, there were several things wrong with this. The acting was cheesy. The setup was contrived. The set design was atrocious. This should not have been as enjoyable as it was. It wasn't a patch on the wedding or the title changes on the flight over to Saudi Arabia. But you know what? Against, against my best wishes, against my, my heart and my soul, I found myself enjoying this. You know what? I, I'm going to give this a B minus. It was actually all right. It was actually okay. And yes, I know that that doesn't seem like it with me just reading off the ridiculous stuff that happened to you. But if you've seen it, you'll understand that it was actually pretty funny for what it was. And I can't... I cannot believe that I'm admitting that. Nothing on the heights of the 24-7 division so far, but not a bad installment either, to be honest. Next up, we get a little bit of fallout between Becky Lynch and Natalia uh, after their match. They cut separate backstage promos in separate sort of segments of the arena. Uh, Becky's is really good. One of her best promos for a while. She says things like, Natalia can bring all 5,000 members of the Hart family to SummerSlam if she wants. She's still not going to be able to beat her. She says that, oh, Natalia accused her of... And Natalia accused Becky on social media of the machine getting behind her. And Becky said, that's not because I was a suck up or anything like that. It's literally because I gave them no choice but to fall in line. I fought and I won, which is kind of really what actually happened. She also says things like, when I was changing the industry, you were on Total Divas changing your bikini. When I was in the stands bleeding in the build-up to Survivor Series, you were perfecting your duck face on Instagram. And then Natalia's promo comes along and it's, oh, it's just not as good. It's a little bit messy. Natalia says something along the lines of like, Becky, you can't even break my arm. 
with your arm bar because even if you do break my arm, I'm still not going to tap out. And I was like, oh no, that's not what you meant, was it? I know what you mean, but you said it wrong. Overall, this gets a B minus. Becky's was excellent, her promo. Uh, I also thought that sometimes, sometimes, right, I'm a huge Becky Lynch fan, of course, but sometimes I feel like she might stray into making her opponents look foolish in her promos, thereby making it less effective when she beats them. Or if they beat her, then it seems like she's just lost to someone who she's been calling a dope all the time. But this one skirted that line perfectly. She attacked Natalia's character, but not her in-ring ability, which was cool. Natalia's promo, unfortunately, drags the average down, but I'm still giving it a B minus grade. I thought it was pretty decent, and I'm looking forward to them match you know i'm looking forward to their match at SummerSlam. next up paul Heyman and the universal champion brock lesnar hit the ring and they gloat about lesnar destroying seth rollins last week and then Heyman says it seems like everyone needs a new hero but i've got some bad news found out some insider info turns out rollins is actually here today i was like why are you gonna reveal that just have him cut them off that'll get a bigger pop surely Heyman says why would you cheer someone with more balls than brains and then rollins just goes to entirely prove him right he limps out with a chair limps all the way down to the ring uh lesnar like beckons him onwards because he's like you're limping come on rollins gets in the ring very slowly and then it's all a ruse he was just selling like a bloody pro wrestler except it doesn't work at all so yeah rollins was playing possum charges across the ring and lesnar just goes bang sit down just kicks him straight in the chest i was like hang on wasn't he gonna have like the element of surprise here lesnar just beats him down chair shots germans f5 you know the drill and i was like what was that meant to do to help us get behind seth rollins we go to commercial and then afterwards Cole reveals that actually during commercial Lesnar came out and hit another F5 then Rollins gets on the mic and cuts what I'm gonna call diplomatically a very misguided promo. Seth basically gets on the mic and just he's kind of coughing and going oh I've got to decide whether this is worth it and it's so melodramatic and it's so not what we all grew to love about Seth Rollins man. Like, I really enjoyed Rollins, for example, during his heel run in 2015 when he was smarmy and superior and he's obviously a more natural heel than he is a babyface, but you don't need to totally sacrifice that side of his character to make him an effective babyface. He was doing fine before WrestleMania. At some point after Mania, WWE's machine has kind of gone, right, he is the next ultra babyface superstar, let's be more hands-on with him. Don't be more hands-on with him. That only makes it a little bit worse, really. Not a little bit worse, actually. A lot worse. You end up getting promos like this one. Anyway, Rollins teases that he's going to give up. He's getting a smattering of booze. He's getting some what chants. People really aren't buying this. He's crawling around the ring going, but then I realised when you love something so much, you have to keep fighting for it and all this sort of stuff. And then he says, um, I will be at SummerSlam and I'm going to beat Brock Lesnar. I guarantee it. And then he leaves. And I've got to give it a D minus because I really, really hated this from the beatdown that made Rollins look stupid and like an idiot. And then the promo afterwards, which just didn't endear him to me at all. And I, Seth Rollins is one of my favorite in-ring guys in the world. And it's just a real shame that his character's being dragged down so much recently. Next up, the War Raiders squash some jobbers. Corey Graves compares one of them to the front man from Code and Cambria, which I did in my head seconds before he said it. I swear down. Anyway, the War Raiders win, obviously. Uh, this gets a C-minus. They've been doing it for slightly too long now for my liking, but let's see where it goes. Uh, hopefully they get a shot at the title soon. Next up, because we're in Pittsburgh, Kurt Angle gets a special guest referee slot for Drew McIntyre versus Cedric Alexander. Before that, he hangs out with the Street Profits backstage a little bit. It's a weird mismatch. I guess it's okay. Uh, why don't the Street Profits wrestle ever? Why do they just turn up at Raw, hang around backstage with their NXT tag team titles and just comment on what's going on, you know? Anyway, Drew's there and reminds Kurt, look, this is all great fun, guys, but last time I wrestled you, Kurt, I beat you and humiliated you and all this sort of stuff. And he says, if you don't call our match down the middle, I'm going to crack your skull. Then he heads to ringside. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens. And you know what? It actually turns out even better than I thought because we get to the ring and the, the match doesn't even begin because Drew jumps Cedric during his entrance. They have a nice intense brawl around the ringside area. Cedric is able to hit a tornado DDT off one of the crowd barriers and they're both laid out on the ramp. Angle's in the ring in his referee vest just like what's going on like when's the match gonna start and the lights go down that is when angle is attacked by the fiend bray wyatt of course who clamps on the mandible claw which i'm delighted to see that he has inherited from mick foley i think the move fits his character and his own menacing aura really love it not sure why michael cole didn't realize it was going to be wyatt when the lights started shutting off one by one but apart from that pretty solid segment i'm gonna give it a b plus the backstage stuff with the street profits i'm not wild about the the brawl between Drew and Cedric was absolutely fine, and then the Bray Wyatt stuff was excellent. I think that all averages out 
into a nice B plus grade. Next up, Tag Champs versus Tag Champs, but without the gold on the line. Uh, it's the SmackDown title holders, the New Day, against the Raw Tag Team Champions, the OC. And Gallows is wearing face paint again. Oh! But AJ Styles gets involved immediately and the match is thrown out, but then Ricochet comes in to clear the heels out of the ring, and you know what that means. Holla holla, player player, Teddy Long's in the house. Not literally, that's a tremendous shame. I wish he had been there. It's time for six-man tag team action. Gallows, Anderson and Styles versus Ricochet, Woods and Big. This was a decent match. It was pretty short though and I found the finish to be a little bit weird actually where Gallows had been on the outside and then went to get on the apron. I, I assume he was going to get in the ring and interfere but the referee was over there so quickly it just looked like he was trying to stop Gallows getting on the apron even though he was in the tag match. So it was like get down off the apron and Gallows is like literally what are you talking about? Anyway, it distracts the referee enough that Styles is able to snag Woods' leg as he hits the ropes, and then Anderson can take control. Gallows tags in because the referee gives him some actual breathing space, and the OC hit the magic killer on Woods and pick up the big heelish victory. This gets a B-, minus. it was pretty short for what it was, but also decent action, a lot of moves being hit all over the place. The finish was a bit confusing, but I think it was a decent build to Styles versus Ricochet at SummerSlam. Next up, Samoa Joe's back out, still wanting an apology from Roman Reigns, and still Reigns is nowhere to be seen. Joe grabs a chair from ringside, sits on it for a bit, and says, well, we're just gonna hold up the show until Reigns gets here. Like when a teacher at school is like, I can wait all day, it's your break time you're missing out on, and everyone's like, shut up. Joe heads to the back and then out to the parking lot where Roman Reigns' car is approaching. How late is Roman for Monday Night Raw? Timekeeping skills, Roman, please. Joe and Roman have a bit of a shouting match with Roman getting out of his car. Uh, then Roman looks off to the side. He's like, oh no, what's that? jumps into his car and a second car hits that one and then drives away and we never saw who was inside of it. <gasps> Joe, despite being currently embroiled in a feud with Roman and being one of the most merciless heels on the entire roster, is aghast. He's like, Roman, no, stay down, man. You'll be okay. Someone get some help here, which is strange. Also, watch this back. Watch Joe just needlessly damage the door of the car because Roman isn't caught in the door at all, but Joe goes over and just like kicks the door off its hinges almost just to free up a little bit more space. Really good friendship there, well done. Roman hurt like his shoulder or something, or maybe his leg or his groin. He's selling all over the place and is doing that same dazed, confused thing that he was doing when he was attacked on SmackDown last week. Uh, Triple H comes down to help out. I'm not sure if Triple H is the right guy you want in this sort of situation, given his track record with vehicular assaults, really. But maybe he's changed now. We all change as we get older. Maybe Triple H is a new man. I'm going to give this a C-. minus. I thought everyone involved did a decent job or as good of a job as they could do, given the circumstances. But the reason that I don't really like these, these little weird ambush scenes is because of the production. I think they're far too melodramatic. I think it's too many camera angles. It's too silly. Um, there, were, there wasn't that many camera angles this week, but there was a weird one from like afar. And yeah, I just think it feels all a bit hokey and false, like Joe slowly approaching Roman, but obviously leaving enough space so the car's gonna drive in. You knew something was gonna happen watching it, which really takes you out of it, I think. And yes, I've given it a C minus, but I can't give it too low of a grade because I still love a whodunit mystery storyline. If it does turn out to be Joe in the end with an accomplice, I'm gonna be sad. But if it turns out to not be Joe at all, and it's someone else, then I'm gonna be pretty excited about it. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. I guess they gotta reveal it on SmackDown or at SummerSlam. We'll see where this goes. Next up, the Iconics versus the Kabuki Warriors versus Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville versus Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross in an elimination tag team match for those women's tag team titles. Remember those? Remember those titles? Not just that, but the champions are out first. The Iconics dominate the opening stages, but then Billy Kay gets caught with a Mandy Rose knee and the champions are pinned and there's going to be new champions. I thought they should have made a little bit more of a moment out of this, maybe, with the Iconics like throwing a huge tantrum or having to be carried out of the arena because they're so aghast. But, you know, it didn't ruin the match or anything. I just thought that should have been a little bit more of a moment. The match progresses a little bit. This went quite long, actually, about 20 minutes or so. The match went on for a few minutes, and then Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville were the next ones out. Mandy tapping out to the Asuka lock, and we're down to Asuka and Kyrie against uh, Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss. There's some nice interplay between Alexa and Kyrie earlier on, uh, with Kyrie going like, oh, I'm just taller than you there, because they're both quite short. And then Alexa, you know, knocking Kyrie down and going, yeah, I'm actually taller than you now, mate. That's pretty good stuff, and the ending is pretty good as well. It's actually Nikki who effectively wins the titles for her team, pushing Kyrie Sane when she's heading up for the insane elbow, uh, and then trapping Asuka as she hits a missile like a baseball slide in the ring apron, starting to beat on Asuka, and that allows Alexa in the ring to hit the Twister Bliss on Kyrie, and now, Alexa and Nikki are the new 
women's tag team champions. I'm going to give this a B minus. I have mixed feelings, really. I'm so pleased that the tag titles have some prominence again. At the same time, I felt like this match could have been handled a little bit better. More of a moment for the Iconics being eliminated, maybe, and potentially even having Asuka and Sane win the titles. Although if this leads to like a feud between them and Alexa and Nikki, and then they win the titles, that might be good also. But I just don't want to see the Kabuki Warriors get done dirty again, you know what I mean? But no, it was a decent match, not the best thing on the show, but at least it felt big, and at least those tag titles are back on TV once again. And finally, we end the show with one of my favorite wrestling tropes, a contract signing with a twist, that's right. Can we just give a quick A-plus for how fantastic The Miz looked in this segment, by the way? That suit was a risky choice, but boy, did he pull it off. Shawn Michaels comes out with The Miz to oversee proceedings, and then here comes Dolph Ziggler, also dressed up for the contract signing, and he's all intense, as he always is. He signs the contract, and he cuts a savage promo and says that when he defeats The Miz at SummerSlam, he's going to become a living legend. Miz cuts a promo right back, tearing into Dolph and saying, you've really made me mad. I cannot wait to get my hands on you next week on Monday Night Raw. And Ziggler's like... <laughs> Which, uh, oh, we're gonna have to keep that in as well, aren't we? Miz explains that the contract didn't say Ziggler versus Miz, uh, and that he's given up his SummerSlam moment for someone who might not have too many left. Michael squares up to Ziggler. Everyone thinks it's gonna be Michaels. Not everyone thinks it's gonna be Michaels, but some people think it's gonna be Michaels, and then Michaels goes, it's not me, and Goldberg's music hits. Goldberg heads out to the ring. Everyone pops huge for Goldberg, which is nice to see. Ziggler gets out of there. He doesn't want any of Goldberg, obviously. He's the kayfabe strongest wrestler ever. Uh, Ziggler gets out of the ring. Goldberg signs the contract, picks up the mic and says, Dolph Ziggler, you're next. Big pop again. Ziggler's backing all the way up the ramp. He's terrified. Bang! Sweet chin music from Shawn Michaels to close the show. Yes! A- minus for that closing segment. Loved it. Loved the fact that Goldberg's getting a chance to redeem himself after that awful match with Taker. Taker got a chance to at the last pay-per-view in that tag match. And now I can't wait to see Goldberg versus Ziggler because I think this stands a decent chance, actually, of being an entertaining squash match. Overall, this Raw gets a B grade. I thought there were good moments and bad ones, but I think the good ones just outweighed the bad ones. Good moments like Andrade versus Rey, or the closing segment, or the Angle and Wyatt stuff, or the fact that the women's tag team titles are a little bit more prominent once again. So yes, I think this was a decent go-home show for SummerSlam. I'm looking forward to quite a lot of the matches on that show, actually. It seems to have crept up a little bit, but they're pulling it together at the 11th hour. Let's see how SmackDown does tomorrow, and thank you very much for joining in. Thanks very much for watching, and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter at Cultaholic, and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.